the Know Your Gear podcast. Hey everyone, welcome to the Know Your Gear podcast episode 348. We're so close to 350, but I put up four fingers. <laughs> 350. I don't even know why holding up five fingers means 350. Anyways, uh, we're going to be doing a, uh, a pre-recorded show. I hope you guys enjoy it. Um, there are some live people joining me here, patrons, channel members, and so on. Um, as you guys know, I'm not going to the NAM, but I'm going to uh, be at the Kiesel event this Saturday uh, doing a clinic. And um, uh, one of the questions that came last week was, will I videotape it? <laughs> Which I'm like, no, I don't use videotapes anymore. I use digital content. To no, I'm just kidding. Uh, no, am I going to film it? And um, the uh, I don't think we are because I, I, you know, Kiesel wants this event to be more in person. However, what I will be doing the clinic about, I will be filming a, a version of it and then posting it. Uh, it won't be the same, but at least you'll have the context of what it is because I think what I'm going to be talking about the clinic and what I'm going to be doing is going to be really interesting. I've put a lot of time into it. So that being said, we have so many questions that come in through the week uh, to talk about and, and go on. And of course, there's some people here that might be throwing some stuff at me as well. Um, I'm going to start jumping into a couple things. Plus, I want to make a huge announcement, which is um, the Steve, the owner of Bell Tone Guitars. You guys, if you know Bell Tone Guitars, that's great. If you don't, uh, check out my video of the Bell Tone Guitar. Bell Tone Guitars are made in Florida. Man USA, premium guitars. Uh, this was one right here. The one I reviewed in that video is slightly different, but this is the one I have here that I've had now for about a year or so. And uh, it's kind of like a hybrid. It's kind of like a Les Paul and a Tele meets each other. And that's what's been amazing about it. Um, and he, what he's doing is he's doing a giveaway um, for charity. So he's giving out the exact, the one I have, the one you see uh, pretty much every week or every few, you know, every other episode you see on my wall, this one with the P90s and this beautiful blue, he's giving away an identical, identical one to that one. Let me show you. And he's doing it for Hungry for Music. So it's a charity uh, thing. So again, um, this is great. And it's a raffle. So it's a charity raffle. So um, basically, let me share with you, uh, of course, my sharing screen doesn't work. Oh, it does. It's just his, the screen was uploading slow. Okay. There you go. So you can win this guitar. This is the guitar, uh, you purchase to win. However, it's not that bad. I think it's like, yeah, see, um, uh, basically buy for $10, you get five entries, 25 bucks, 15. I would, you know, do whatever you're comfortable with and read about the charity. Like I said, this is going to charity. This isn't a cash grab. He's giving away a 20 eight hundred dollar guitar that's how much this guitar costs um so and and um you know i should show you do i have it i do it even comes with they come with these beautiful bell tone cases that are blue and they sell bell tone right so very cool so basically anytime we can support charity we do that here on the channel um so like i said d donations will benefit hungry for music the owner of bell tone has given away a three thousand basically three thousand dollar guitar so, you know, if you could give five bucks to charity and maybe win a $3,000 guitar, it's not the worst thing you can do with your money this week. <laughs> maybe it is. I don't think it is. I think it's really great. So I wanted to share that with you. I will probably cover it at the end of the show as well. And uh, it is, oh, and this is probably important to mention. Uh, when is it too? So, you know, in case you want it to line up with a payday or something, um, it, I believe it goes till uh, the drawing ends on, or they draw on February 12th and it is, a, and it starts, ends February 11th. So, so you can, so you have some time. So check that out. Okay. Let me get back to a main screen. That would help me if I could see what you guys are talking about. Okay. Now, um, before we go into any early riser questions, questions for the week, I got a like a pummeling of questions sent to me. And this is a subject that I didn't know if I wanted to talk about until a I got not one, not two, not three, not four. You see where this is going? Uh, um, let's just say I got a lot of questions from some even close friends concerned that I'm somehow involved in this. 
<laughs> okay? Uh, and so I'm going to uh, explain it, explain the situation, and then explain uh, whether I am involved or not involved in this. So what am I talking about? If you haven't seen, I will put the link down below so you can watch it after you watch this, uh, where Steve, the owner of Iconic Guitars, if you don't know who Iconic Guitars are, they're amazing guitars. I did a video uh, with uh, my, my buddy Matt, who's uh, also one of my, my guitar teacher, and he worked for me for 12 years, I think. And um, in that video, he's playing his Iconic Guitar. Iconic guitars are in the level, in my opinion, of Sir Tom Anderson. They're another high-end boutique California builder. So they're like that Kiesel, you know, uh, Sir, uh, you know, Tom Anderson, you name it. It's iconic. Now, they're, I think they're a smaller shop than the, than the well, definitely than Kiesel, but maybe, um, you know, than Sir and stuff. And uh, what's going on with that? Well, um, he did a video saying he had to do some layoffs. Now, if that is not... Shocking right now, as we know, we've talked about companies closing. We'll talk about Rain Song guitars at closing and talk about things going on in the industry at the same time. Two Rock Amps just bought divided by 13 amps. So, I mean, things are constantly happening in this industry. None of this is shocking. It's always, always, always doing the same thing, right? Companies are buying other companies, company. But this video was powerful because what he said was that he has to lay off some employees. It's worse, you know, some of the worst things you can hear, right? People losing their jobs, their livelihoods. You know, it's a traumatic uh, event. If you haven't uh, been laid off from a job or if you've had to be, in, be at a job where people were laid off, I mean, you know, they even bring grief counselors in sometimes for this because it is a huge deal, you know, um, to, to have this happen to you. So in the video, he alludes that um, not only does Iconic build guitars, but they are an OEM. So we've talked about this. OEM is someone who basically ghost builds. That's a nice way to put it. They're building somebody else's brand in their factory or shop. In his particular case, he's building for a few companies. He said that. Some he said he couldn't say, which I think is what how I got brought into this. <laughs> and uh, some he could say. The one he specifically was talking about that was most important, even though passively mentioned that he's done stuff for Friedman and other companies, BC Rich. And the BC Rich thing, believe it or not, I had already known this story. Okay, so so everything, so you, you gotta understand, I didn't watch this video with, I just wanna be, again, transparent, upfront about it. I didn't watch this video with like, filter, you know, like what? Hey, BC Rich is, I already had knew, known from friends in the industry that he was going through turmoil and troubles with BC Rich not paying him is what I was told. Now, this is what's important. I'm not an insider on this. I don't know what's, I don't have any information. Um, I know Bill Xavier. I, when I say no, I've met him. I'm uh, Facebook friends with him. I don't know what that means. Um, uh, and uh, I, and I don't even know Steve. So there you go. So that that's where <laughs> that connects. Um, and there are multiple. I'm sure there's multiple sides to the story. But the story that he is talking about is the fact that basically BC Rich. Um, Order guitars, you know, kind of told them they were kind of gave them the dream story. Hey, we're gonna we're gonna order uh, a lot of guitars. You know, they talk about the stranger thing, four hundred guitars, and then it ended up being one eighty six. And then um, um, in the video, even though it was long and I, it was thirty nine minutes, I watched it twice, which you know, the second time is growing because he's really obviously in distress, so he's not being clear with his thoughts. Uh, he has to repeat a lot. Um, I was still confused with if he's saying like they he built guitars and they're not and he gave them to them and they're not paying him or they didn't pay him or they canceled orders on things that he was basically like chickens before they you know hatch kind of thing like uh, you know he was like anticipating getting these orders and they had alluded that they were going to do these orders and then they canceled um kind of like when fender said all the dealers canceled on them and then they all this inventory kind of same story um but uh Either way, let me let me just discuss a few things that are interesting. The, the way I got <laughs> kind of pulled into this because it's not publicly pulled into it, but you know, people reaching out to me was uh, obviously I I had some involvement uh, or am involved. No, had some involvement as probably more accurate. As you know, I helped start a company which was Badlands Guitars, um, and the question was: Is Badlands Guitars made an iconic? And of course, is this going to affect? those guitars being delivered to the people who ordered them. So there's a couple of things I got to tell you. First, the most important thing is this. I cannot tell you with 100% certainty, 100% certainty that I, Iconic is not building any Badlands guitars. What I can tell you is, is that if you ordered a Redline guitar or a hollow flash guitar, I know with certainty 
it is not being built by Iconic Guitars. Because <laughs> I, I obviously you know I was involved with that. My involvement with Badlands is is over now. I have already have, have concluded what I was going to do. I have other things to do. So when I say it's over now, I mean, uh, you know, I'm I'm doing other things. I have other things to accomplish. I mean, just it was really a, a lot of time. That's why there's four partners to get this started. The main thing was to help get it started, and I believe it is started. My Hollow Flash is one of my favorite guitars, and um, and and if there's any you know future benefits to working together, maybe that's a possibility. But as of now, no. That's why I say I can't say with 100% certainty because anything I haven't interacted with them about with the guitar building process, I wouldn't know anything about. Okay. Um, so, uh, but uh, like I said, the hollow flash, if you have a hollow flash and you're waiting for it, here's what I can tell you that I know for a fact. These are what I know for a fact. Uh, unlike BC Rich, <laughs> Badlands paid for every guitar up front because we took your money and paid for the guitars up front. Um, there was never, uh, we never have solicited any company ever, no manufacturer ever in any way, shape, form, either for a prototype or anything and said, Hey, why don't you build this for, by the way, that's very common in this industry, right? It's kind of net terms, right? Like build us all this stuff. And then when it's done, we'll pay you. Or after it's done, we'll pay you within 30 days or 60 days. We paid for every single thing up front. More importantly, we even released payments Sorry, when I say we paid up front, I mean, we had the money up front. It was put into basically an escrow account. I'm just going to tell you guys this because this is seemed to be a concern for some people. Um, the money is not given directly to the factory because what happens if, like Iconic, Iconic's not closing, but what if they had closed? And then, you know, the, so even though they didn't get paid by BC Rich, what happens if BC Rich had paid them with customers' money like Badlands and then, you know, they close and, and now you don't get a guitar. What's happened is, is Badlands, uh, this is where I was involved with Badlands. A lot of people kind of associated a lot of my uh, work with them is to the tech the technical part of the guitars that's not where my focus was my focus was on the business side more so and one of the things i um basically was adamant about again at least for these first two runs so I, again any changes happening after i could find out for you guys um but those um i was adamant that um the uh the company be paid up up front but when I say upfront, I mean the money is put into an escrow account with an attorney and then released in pieces as the company needs it. So in other words, when you guys paid Badlands your money for your guitars, what happened was the en enough money was given to the factory to buy all the components and parts. So the factory had to put nothing out of pocket, nothing, okay? We, but the rest of the, the, the labor wasn't paid yet, right? The other factors of the guitars weren't paid yet because they were in escrow. Once the parts arrived, once the, the, like the bodies and necks and stuff. Now, hardware is different because the hardware hasn't arrived, but we know it's coming because we bought it. We bought that from Goto. So Badlands bought the hardware separately from the factory. So they own, you know, so they could own it. So they don't have to worry about that. Um, then when the factory would show like for the Redline series, hey, the, we have 25 bodies painted or we had half the bodies painted, then a, another release of the chunk of money would release to them. Not only has that happened, but just so you know, uh, Badlands requires and required, I should say required for sure, but I'm sure continue to require a uh, insurance policy that is for Badlands to be insured in case something happens. So if the factory burns down, we're they're insured. Um, you think like that's common. That is not common. That does not happen in this industry. Okay. So that was all the steps taken to make sure. So when people are reaching out to me, they go, oh my goodness, is, you know, it's iconic not going to be making the Badlands. They don't make the Badlands. And even if the, that puts worry that, you know, some other things are happening, th there's a reason why I was involved in the starting of this company and why there's four people involved. We are people in this industry that have seen exactly what we're going to talk about, which is the iconic Beast Rich thing. I, I can't sit here with almost 350 episodes, 700 hours of talking about this industry and the factories and who buys who and who screws who and who's suing who and not have the, uh, you know, the foresight to do, pr do proper steps when uh, doing that. So that's that's how that works. So that's the first thing I wanna get out of the way is there's no involvement there for us. Okay, so the thing with Iconic is really horrible. I know people are talking about it. There's a lot of like, I see a lot of, I saw every time B-Search is posting, people are like, pay Iconic, what is with you guys? You know, but here's the problem. And I, I thought about reaching out to Bill, but I'm gonna be honest with you. If you guys t saw a couple months ago, I wanted to buy one of those Iconic made. I knew Iconic made it. So let me just tell you what I knew. I knew Iconic had made the uh, Nagel BC Rich guitars, okay? You guys knew I wanted one and uh, I was gonna buy one. And 
here's what I told you guys. Not only were they crazy expensive, but I've explained to you guys, if you guys go and Google uh, gear nuts, N-U-T-S, <laughs> gear nuts at Reverb, what will come up is a, a company called Gear Nuts on Reverb. Gear Nuts, as I've explained before, is Sweetwater. I don't know if Sweetwater wants me telling anybody that or not, but they didn't tell me this. I discovered this on my own as a gear freak who spends probably more time on Reverb than you can spend to get a college degree. Okay, so, um, and not only is where Gear Nuts will offload certain products, maybe products that are, they have a bunch of and stuff, this is where the Blim stuff go. And I've told you guys, and I showed you this before, and it's still consistently happening now. And I'm only pointing this out because I understand the outrage. You know, BC Rich isn't, this is what you guys have heard. BC Rich isn't there paying their bills, people are losing their jobs, and the guy at Iconic is getting screwed. And all of that could be 100% true. But maybe Steve, if he sees this, doesn't know this. But I happen to know something because, as you know, I have a kind of in with the Sweetwater guys. L there has been issues. So here are the issues that I know of. And none of these are to prove or disprove anything. But the more information we have as a community of guitar players, maybe it'll stop the crazy, which the crazy is when you get the pitchforks and the, and the flames and all this stuff. Um, here's a, a BC Rich, uh, Rich ST24 USA handcrafted guitar for $3,800. Uh, this guitar is, like I said, $4,000. This guitar says used, very good. It is not used. It is, it is new. If you go to the condition here, it says there is a finish discolor discolorization on the treble side corner of the neck pocket. There is a dent on the back of the body. When you go and look at these BC Rich guitars, and this is again for Iconic, and I again, I'm not saying anything bad. I'm not defending BC Rich and I'm not defending Iconic. I don't know either of them and care about them okay i care about the guitars um and i and of course because i do a weekly show where we talk about what's going on in the in the uh in the industry i thought you know this is there's just no way to ditch stuff like this and not talk about it um all of the nagels that i saw for sale i didn't see the ones that came and, bought and sold in a second but all the ones i saw for sale have a blemish a dent a nick a flaw and I was unwilling to buy a guitar, even with a discount. In fact, I can show you so you know, because there's a ton of Beast Rich guitars here. Let me go back. Um, here's a Nagel, $5,800. This is $6,000. What is, it says use. What is the issue? It says the bottom strap button on the guitar is a slightly recessed into the body. In other words, right? There are dents on the back plate. And the upper side, by the way, the something that uh, the Tone King was freaking out about, that you guys had proper cases. Not only is he uh, 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 fixated on cases. Uh, where I'm a gig bag uh, guy, uh, TK is a case fanatic, right? He loves cases um, and he loves good quality cases. Um, this inspired some of the freak out on the hollow flash line of why your cases were improved on the hollow flash line. Um, because... There's so much damage to the Beast Rich. One thing that what we learned from from some Sweetwater information was that their cases were not fitted correctly for those kind of guitars. Those guitars are not fitted correctly in the cases, in our opinion. And our opinion being that we had no guitars get damaged from being in a case. And, you know, so, I mean, obviously we've put a lot of time into this. Um, so, so it could be that. You know, I mean, there's more to the story. Again, I'm not saying, you know, anyone's wrong. I just want you to have all the information. And again, this is possible. Iconic doesn't know. Maybe b Search doesn't feedback them. I would say, look, I'll tell you, and this is my experience, like I said, never talking to Steve, but Bill at Beast Rich, I've only tried to talk to him once and I reached out to him twice uh, since we're friends on Facebook. You know what that means, right? <laughs> Nothing. Um, but I figured I had a line to him and I reached out to him when I tried to buy a Nagel. And um, if you want, I, I think I can read you the thing if you want, but I'm, I'm just going to paraphrase it. I said, hey, Bill, it's Phil McKnight. I would love to buy a Nagel. However, as you know, I'm really, uh, I really like to, you know, make sure it's not heavy. Um, is there a way, you know, I'm not asking for a discount. I'm not asking for any favors. Is there anyone I can get one, you know, um, you know, keep in mind, I know they're in stock at Sweetwater. I know they're everywhere, but they're they're just, they're not listing weights. And I go, if there's a way I can get the weight uh, on one, just a lighter one. I didn't even want to be picky about the weight, just not a 10 pounder or nine pounder. No response. I forgot what the second time I responded to him. He never responded. I talked to uh, Sweetwater and Sweetwater told me, which again, I'm not trying to bring Sweetwater in this because it's not, but the employee at Sweetwater that I deal with, I said, I'm trying to buy the guitar. Can you find out some information about these guitars? And he said, sure. 
because that's what the sales guys do. And he responded to me, I think, a day or two later and said, uh, we're just not getting any responses from BC Riches uh, about this information you want. And, um, and then finally, so you know, a day or two after that, so like four days later, my Sweetwater rep uh, called me and said, hey, BC Rich got back to us and said, uh, this is the, oh, uh, I, I can tell you what I was asking. All I wanted to know was on nowhere, currently still, by the way, nowhere on BC Rich's website or on the listing, does it say that it's painted? It just says that it's a graphic, right? Um, which was, you know, it's, it's, I just showed you, it's a six, I mean, that was the discounted one. There are 6,500 if they don't have blemishes, but all of them had seemed to have, or most of them had blemishes. Um, the, um, they didn't say clearly that this was painted by anybody. And I was like, are they painted or the graphic? They're using the word graphic. And uh, it took four days after, but I finally got an answer and they said, yes, Beast Rich got back and said, it's painted. <laughs> but he didn't seem super sure. <laughs> so, um, so, that's basically, you know, there's there's a lot of angles to a story, okay? Um, but I, I, I feel bad for Iconic, so you know. Um, I don't believe Iconic did anything wrong. Let me go back to my main screen. I don't have any inside information on this. Sometimes I, as you know, I, lo I know a lot of people and I'm, I'm involved in a lot of things. But, um, you know, this is not one of those things. And I p was planning on a the typical Friday show, if it came up, if it got thrown at me knowing that it came up this week, I was probably just going to stay with, um, yeah, it's really heartbreaking and it's really horrible to see that. And who knows what's really going on between the two parties. But when I started getting emails going, hey, Phil, am I in trouble? And I'm like, ooh, I should probably help people understand they're not, if you bought a Badlands, you're, you're, that's not involved in this in any way. The shop that makes Badlands, that um, unless it changes, which, you know, like I said, I'm not, I'm not. I'm part of that. Um, it, it is a small shop in California. And right now, as far as I know, they're only making Badlands guitars. That's why it takes so long to make the Badlands guitars. They're not putting us on the, or they're not putting the Badlands on back burners. This is full force to make Badlands. If they could make more, they'd make more. So they're just on it. It's a small shop and they're, they're, they're doing their best. Um, Brian says, it sounds like BC Rich ordered 400 guitars to be made and canceled half the order after Iconic already ordered the ingredients due to the, the lack of demand. Now this is um, this is what I do want to talk about, okay? Um, because uh, you know Steve Iconic, obviously, like I said, I'm, I'm a fan of his brand. I'm a fan of uh, of, of his, his guitars for sure, and he seems and comes across as a smart guy. Plus, more importantly, the people I know that know him that told me the story of you know what was going on before he announced it, um, and I mean months ago, like I knew. I knew what was going on when, you know, uh, <laughs> it's been a while. Uh, so um, uh, they speak very highly of him. Um, this is a really interesting thing. When I talk about, and again, when I talk about the fact that I said, look, we, we didn't want to get a factory to do exactly that. Ramp up their employees. Like I said, the Badlands company uh, ramped up some employees, right? So there's there's more employees in that shop. There's two more employees. Technically, you, it's a small shop. Like I said, it's four or five people. That shop doubles capacity. I know it's tiny. I know it's not the same, but you understand what I'm saying. We we got a shop to double its capacity. We wouldn't have done that if we off of a like a, I think we're gonna sell a guitars, <laughs> right? We had orders in hand. We had money in hand, and we gave it to them, and they hired the people. And then what our job was after the fact was to protect the people that gave our uh, gave us their money. That was the focus point, which is why we have an, uh, an, we had an attorney, and that's why we set it up where it's uh, we call it. Um, so when I was in the finance industry, we would call it a trigger. By the way, so companies would work this way, um, basically as uh, you know, if you hit a certain target point, they would release more money to you, and then it would trigger a release and trigger a release, and it also could tr trigger a holdback. By the way, that could also happen. For instance. If the shop building the Badlands, for instance, was to fall behind schedule or fall behind a promise, that would trigger a non-release of payment. So that shop could be in trouble too, right? But it's not, it's, it wouldn't, it wouldn't, the money wouldn't go anywhere. It'd just be waiting for them to, to hurry up and get back on track so the money can be released and things can go smoothly so everybody's uh, taken care of. So maybe Steve, um, 
should do that some more. I, I don't, out of a courtesy to a friend, I have another friend who is a OEM. Um, you know, you guys, you know, everybody watches the same channels. I can tell you, um, uh, you know, it, some of you will probably figure out who I'm talking about because of the fact that the channels we all interact with. He builds uh, guitars and he builds all kinds of things. And even he got into a bad way, which is why I don't want to tell you specifically who he is, with exactly this exact situation. He he fronted, uh, in his case, it was $25,000. And he fronted money uh, to build guitars for a very famous builder who, again, defaulted on him. Uh, they didn't They didn't pay. So, you know, and um, and in his case, he sent them the guitar. So he fronted the guitar, sent the guitars and they didn't pay. And he had to, you know, tighten his belts, buckle up and basically ran through it. And then luckily uh, through a, a, a good luck, good fortune, a partner in that endeavor on the other, on the guitar company is now making payments to make it whole or good is what I understand. Um those are things that happen in this industry, which is why it's tough to do this. You know, this happens all the time, by the way, overseas too. Companies order a thousand guitars overseas and then the factory doesn't deliver. It happens. It happens all the time. Every time somebody reach out, it's one of the, you know, I, ne I never get asked, thank goodness. I never get asked like, what question are you sick of answering? <laughs> I don't really know if I have a question that I'm sick of answering. I can tell you a question that I hate answering and it usually gets sent to me directly more so than on the channel which is hey phil i have an idea i want to have guitars made in china with my new brand called super cool guitars and how do you think i should go about this and the the sad thing is is i all i can tell you i can't help you all i can tell people is there are 19 out of 20 ways to fail doing that and I'm not saying you'll fail. I'm saying that you got to figure out the one in 20 way for that situation to happen for it not to go wrong. As you guys know, or some of you may not know, because everybody doesn't watch the show for a long period of time, you know that I've been repairing guitars uh, for uh, 20 years. Some people know, especially if you recently saw me on the Blake podcast, on, on um, uh, uh, Tone Junkies podcast, which is Blake, um, uh, so, sorry, Tone Mob. Why am I saying Tone Junkies? I always have problem with Tone Junkies and Tone Mob. I'm sorry, Tone Junkies. Sorry, Tone Mob. If you saw me on Tone Mob, you, you heard this story recently too, which I've told before a long time ago. How I became a guitar repair person was I was building instruments first. I wasn't repairing instruments. I was building basses. And then I got this great idea to have basses made overseas. And then I got hundreds. My first order was 400 basses. Uh, that was my first order of import instruments. And they were all defective. 400. I'm one person. <laughs> I, to not lose my home and my ass, I don't think I would have lost that, but it was close. Um, I, ha I stayed up every night fixing every single one, modifying every one, doing everything I could. And, and I actually got, instead of hating it and got sick of it, I actually got, it drew me in. I was like, oh, I kind of like fixing things more than building things. This is like, it's a challenge. The fixing is more like a puzzle and the building is more like just a project, right? So, um, and the reason they did that to me was because 400 is nothing. So to them, it was no big deal. They, I paid them, uh, which was a large chunk of money. They sent me a, I forgot, I don't know if that was a half container or what that was, but the first order, the next order was much bigger. Um, and yeah, I did it again, by the way, because I kind of learned from that and I learned how to hold them a little bit more accountable. And I learned how to get them to, to write into a contract, a buyback, like, hey, defective instruments up to a certain percentage, you're taking them back or crediting me, crediting me something. And, um, and this is the things that you have to do in the OEM world. And, um, and so that's what's, you know, that's what's important. Um, let's go and see if I have any more. It says, uh, Brian says, if you hit the lottery, Phil, buy one of each of those gunslingers. Um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm not, no, <laughs> actually, you know, I, this is a, there's another question coming up in a second and I'd like to kind of hit that. Um, and, and then I'll make, and I'll explain why I probably lost my love for the, for wanting a gunslinger. Um, Let's see. Also, he said uh, $6,500 is Bitcoin for any guitar. It's, it's insane, man. That's a car almost. 
you can buy somebody a, a, a running transportation to work for $6,500. Uh, but the paint jobs are incredible. I figured they were uh, print under the clear coat. See, that's what I thought too. So that's why I was a little concerned, right? You know, for $6,000 is insane. Um, so, you know, <laughs> crazy. Um, let's see, what else? Uh, does anyone else have any uh, questions of this fiasco and i hate hearing stuff like this because this is going to damage two brands this you know like i said the 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 horrible things that are happening here are are multi-level first of course people lost their jobs that's just horrific okay like i said second you have a company that's in distress steve's in distress I've, i've been in business now for over 20 years i've been exactly where steve has i've had to make decisions of you know do i keep employees or keep a house i've been there I've had that late night sitting at a coffee table or a kitchen table with my wife, like mortgage or pay employees. Like which one do you do? And uh, how do you figure that out? I've been there and um, I never want to be back there again. That's one thing that happens. I've been poor and I've been self-employed and I've been not poor. And I think Cher said once I've been rich and I've been poor. I prefer rich and I've been young and I've been old and I prefer young. Um, I will say the same thing. I will prefer to never be in those situations again, although they were life they were life changing and they taught me a lot. I think I've learned the lesson. I would like to never go back, please. Um, and um, and the decisions I had to make back then were just as horrible as Steve's. Exactly the same decisions. So uh, horrible by every means. And um, and looking back, I don't think I I don't know if I made the right ones. I always say I don't think I made the right ones because they uh, you know maybe I did. I don't know. But um, <laughs> Brian says my daughter's college car costs less than six thousand sixty five hundred dollars. Yeah, I, I was gonna say I, I believe my daughter's Honda is barely worth sixty five hundred dollars, <laughs> and it's a nice car, but it's barely I don't think it's worth sixty five hundred dollars. So so that, that's what's funny. <laughs> um, okay, so um, uh, Michael says uh, sounds similar to what Rickenbacker did to Bedrock amps years ago. There is tons of this. And, um, you know, this is an, this is an industry of passion. And because of that, one of the hardest things I had in my life being a passion, I'm in it because of the passion. Uh, this is not the most lucrative idea ever. (laughs) None of this stuff. None of the things I've ever done. Like I said, I'm always doing 10 things, uh, so that collectively 10 things makes one income. Uh, no, you, you do it for passion and because you're doing it for passion, you will make strange mistakes. And also people that you're working with that are pa- that are doing it for passion may not have the be the best at making business decisions. But this is a business. I think Iconic will survive it based on his, uh, con- his statements. I think he said overall Iconic is doing well. I think he's got to get over the 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 this of Beast Rich. I hope Beast Rich learns from this not only because you know hey things are public now. You know people are gonna know if you if you're if you're having problems or doing things. This is you know think about this now Beast Rich is now on a podcast and I don't know if I have it, that much weight, but it's not, I mean, it's a big enough community to know, here's what you learned today. Beast Rich isn't paying their bills and they're putting out defective guitars because whether or not Conic made the defective guitars, which I don't know. I mean, these l- look like, as far as I know, they're made by Conic, but whether or not it was shipping damage on all these guitars or there was whatever, whatever the issues are, when were they were shipped to Beast Rich and Beast Rich did it. Again, I can't tell you any of that. I don't know. I just know that if you go on gearnutsatreverb.com, or not .com, just Google Gear Nuts at Reverb, takes you to the Reverb site. Um, it is exhausting. Go back. Uh, I, we looked at this nagel. Here's another gunslinger for $3,700. This is $4,000. This is more than I want to pay either. I, I, if I was going to buy a gunslinger, dream gunslinger, I'm sorry. I'm capped out about $2,500. This has $600 in demo savings. What are the demo savings? This has scratches on the neck plate. There are fine scratches on various parts of the instrument. Sure, are these returns? But why, you know, this one I think is an import one, right? Uh, yeah, this is the import. Um, there is a lot of these USO ones. And so you know, there was way more before. Um, at some point when I was paying attention, it, I couldn't tell you for sure. My gut instinct was half of the USB switches I saw that Sweetwater was trying to sell had issues. And I just can't imagine a world where be, uh, where Sweetwater instantly got, you know, dozens and dozens, or if not hundreds, but dozens and dozens of 
$4,000 guitar, sold them all in a, like a week, got them all returned defective. <laughs> it's like, it's just not likely. So there's a lot of people being hurt by this. You know, the retailer's got to deal with this. Everybody's got to deal with this. And, um, you know, it's, it's nuts. It's a nuts thing. And my heart goes out to everybody. But that's uh, that's what it's some insight on it. Um, and insight on it. If there's more to talk about, I'm sure there's going to be YouTube channels out there that will do an investigation and do some serious investigation reporting. Like I said, the Friday show is not an investigation. I'm not a journalist. We're water cooler talking about the industry, and I'm trying to do it with care and kindness and also information that may be uh, useful to people. Because I know sometimes you're watching people and they're just like, they read a thing on the internet and then they tell you what they read. <laughs> uh, that doesn't, that's uh, not what's going on, you know, here on this channel. I hope you understand. Like if I have something to say that can be helpful, like I said, uh, or it give you clarity because I happen to know I'll share. And if I don't, I have many times on this channel said, sorry, I just don't know guys, which is what I wanted to almost say on this issue. Um, so, um, yeah, like I said, I'm hoping and I'm hoping maybe, you know, this will prompt everybody to figure out the issue. It would be really nice for Iconic and Visa Rich to make some mutual announcements about how they maybe they fix this problem for each other. This would be very cool. There's opportunities here. You know, um, you know, uh, 350 episodes of this, how many times was Gibson the villain of the week? And then Gibson was the angel of the week. And then <laughs> Fender is the villain of the week. And then they're the angel of the week. And Kiesel Guitars is horrible to customers. But then Kiesel Guitars is making great guitars. I mean, people are, look, there's all kinds of things. And I think having honest conversations about that, you know, like I said, uh, I screw up. It happens all the time. It sucks. The last thing I want to talk about is that. But it happens. So I sometimes talk about it, you know, and same thing with other people, too. Their, their, their screw-ups are sometimes public. And uh, by the way, smart of Steve was to make the video because the last thing I think what he said, which was perfectly said, is the last thing he needed was other people telling the story of what happened. And uh, and I have no reason to disbelieve what he said. OK, that was a, a long discussion of that. <laughs> Brian says the guitar world is odd. The guitar world is by, by beyond odd. Um, beyond. <laughs> Be on. <laughs> Odd. <laughs> uh, okay, let's see. Uh, all right. Uh, so I was going to tell you uh, how to segue into something that would also connect with this. Um, somebody asked me about um, what I liked at the NAM show. You know, did I see anything so far posted from the NAM show exciting? I did. There's a company on the NAM show uh, that was posting that was really interesting. And what they're doing is printable graphics. Uh, they can basically take your guitar and put graphics on them. And so when, when we talk about the Nagel graphic, they can do cool graphics on guitars. Really cool. I, 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 I just saw the teaser on Instagram. I will talk about it more when I know more. Um, but I thought that was really cool. Obviously, uh, uh, Bad Cat released a mini amp, which, of course, I'm, you know, I'm friends with Bad Cat guys, so I already knew the mini amp was coming. <laughs> so, um, and, um, uh, so that's cool that that got announced. Um, I saw that, uh, you know, ya uh, Yamaha, 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 whatever I say it, uh, released a new uh, new Pacifica. And so, you know, it's always nice to see that they're trying to level up the Pacifica line. Uh, I thought that was really cool. Very, very cool. And um, what else was cool? I didn't see, I haven't seen anything from the Ibanez guys yet. I saw... Um, Strandberg's released a bunch of stuff. It was really crazy. I don't know if you guys, if you haven't taken notice of that, so many crazy things. He's doing a cool, like every day, they were, I think they released 12 new things. You know, what's funny is they sent me a thing. Uh, so if Strandberg, I see this, you see, no, you sent me a thing. You asked me to sign this in, in, in NDA. So I wouldn't tell anybody until the NAMM show. And then you never sent me anything. <laughs> so I don't know what it was. I've been learning like everybody else, but uh, just letting you, just reminding them like, hey, um, Let's see. Uh, uh, Dick DC. I was going to Dick DC. Dick Mabin says, did anyone uh, see the new limited edition gold big muff uh, pie? I didn't uh, see. That's cool. Um, this is what I, I noticed the most. You're seeing lots of product being released. Uh, lots of cool new stuff. Um, so really cool. So um, but the graphic things were pretty cool. And like I said, the, the Bad Cat amp I thought was pretty exciting. There's something, there's some stuff not being released to the show because some companies didn't go to the show that I think is going to be exciting, but that's like in a month. So that was really cool as well. Um, another cool, interesting um, thing that got asked to me, let me go back to my little list here. Um, 
was did I know or somebody wanted me to talk about uh, you know because I mentioned the two rocket bot divided by thirteen. That's what I know. They bond each other. That may they, are, they bought uh, divided by thirteen. That happens a lot. I think that's the future. Um, so that's kind of what I wanted to talk about. Uh, I told you guys I'll give a version of it. The part of the clinic I'm giving tomorrow or tomorrow Saturday at Kiesel is the kind of the future of the industry kind of discussion and then some other cool stuff and stuff. And um, and uh, you know it's funny about that is you think you know you know obviously Jeff Kiesel owns Kiesel you think he'd give that thing but the reason they asked me to do it was because of the fact that you know here we are we're very involved in all this and there's a lot of things going on and I think the future is going to be a lot of brands again always buying other brands real common but also if you look at what and it's kind of going back to Iconic what Iconic was doing um, as I, I mentioned before, um, somebody somebody mentioned uh, w- really important. Somebody mentioned that the reason they thought that Iconic might be making the Badlands guitars was Iconic mentioned that they make a bossy guitars, and then in some discussion, uh, may, uh, maybe it came up that Badlands were made in the same shop as a bossy. This is what I said about two things can be different, but also also be true. Um, there are a ton of people who have made a bossy guitars. Um, and uh, and Tosin has learned all of the hard ways <laughs> that you can uh, you can probably learn when dealing with OEMs. Um, you know, uh, companies that you're probably aware of that made Abasi guitars was Falbo guitars made Abasi guitars for a short while. They do not anymore, of course. Acacia guitars made Abasi guitars. Um, I do not believe they make them anymore. Um, Jack uh, Grover Jackson made Abasi guitars. He still may be making some of those. Of, of course, Iconic said that. Essentially, a lot of people have made Abasi guitars. Um, because of all the things we've just we just talked about, you know, um, my uh, when the Badlands guys approached me and said, "Hey, we want some help, you know, launching this thing," and you would you would be great, you know, we're friends, and you know, hey, what can we, you know, what can you impart? One of the things I told them was one of the only ho- one of the great things about OEM is you can have somebody build a guitar, you build your dream, and you can manage it, and and it's a way to mitigate having to build a shop. One of the downfalls is when your name's on it and not so their name's on it. They might not give a crap. And so uh, I think that's what some companies learn. Uh, you know, Ola Strandberg, if you haven't seen on my other channel, Ola Strang was on my channel, and he was very forthcoming when I asked him that question as the fact that he has been screwed. Strandberg is now made by Cortec. Cortec, who is another friend, June Parker, the owner of Cortec, is a friend. Uh, I love Cortec. They make... Um, they, they've made 24 million guitars, if you don't know that. They've made 24 million guitars in the 50 years they've been in business. They're, I think they're making like over, well, they're over a million a year now, guitars. Big company. They make Strandbergs. So uh, if you get the ones in Indonesia, obviously if you get the ones in Sweden or Japan, that's not uh, Cortec. Um, so Cortec makes really high-end guitars for uh, 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 for Strandberg. But what you may not know is that Strandberg was also going through these same problems back in the day. They had a company called Strictly 7 building their guitars, and they were getting defective bad guitars, and people were paying four or $5,000. This is four or $5,000 in like 2015 money. So think about the inflation change. That's crazy. And um, they were buying these guitars, and they were not very good. And so he moved to, believe it or not, Parker Washburn, right? And that's who started ghost building, OEMing some of the Strandbergs. If you have a U.S. Strandberg, you could have one made from, from Parker Washburn. Well, they got bought by a bigger company, and they shut down that shop. So it's like, you know, it's a it's a very stressful world, which is why um, the guys at Badlands will probably continue to keep the runs very tight. You see what they're doing? And I want you guys to understand this. They're mitigating the risk for themselves, the OEM, and you, because they're smart. You know, not everybody's the Kiesel guys who build a factory from scratch and just have all control of it um, and figure out how to get the pricing right. You know, it's 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 a very hard business to get into and do and, and not screw it up for somebody. So um, uh, Brian says, I figured out who makes Badlands by looking at the Internet photos inside the shops and I'm and I'm sworn to secrecy. Uh, yeah, I, it's up to you guys. I uh, like I, I said this before. Um, uh, initially, what I was told was the factory did not want to be disclosed as building the Badlands guitars, which is why not told. Later, I was told that's not true, that Badlands did not want it disclosed. Um, either way, I don't care. <laughs> so if anyone knows, they could share it. I could care less. I'm not going to share it out of my, uh, you know, uh, for the, for the like the friendship factor. I'm not going to tell on, on them, but uh, t- I don't know if it's tell on them, but I'm not going to say. But you guys can definitely... Um, the only thing I can tell you is is that the Badlands pickups are made by Badlands. 
the you know the Badlands pickups are made by a person who only makes Badlands pickups and essentially works for Badlands. So there you go. Okay, um, I have another subject. There's so many things to talk about. It's such a crazy week. Um, Rain Song Guitars. That was another company came up. Rain Song Guitars closed. If you're not familiar with Rain Song Guitars, um, they were uh, a very prominent carbon fiber acoustic brand. I um, was a Rain Song dealer for a few years, and I owned a Rain Song for a, a while, and I really loved it. Um, uh, I thought the edges of the fretboard on mine were a little harsh, and over time I didn't fall in love with that. But I've played others at, from time to time, and they didn't have that issue. And uh, and at the time, for my needs and my wants, they were pretty expensive and pretty much out of my range, even though I was a dealer. Remember, just because you can buy them for your store doesn't mean you want to own them because of the you know you know uh, that's part of the downfall of owning a store. Sometimes you don't make all the money to buy everything you want. Um, and uh, my understanding is that the owner of Rain Song Guitars is uh, essentially retiring. There's no successorship. Since successionship? I don't know if that's the word I'm looking for. Uh, you understand. There's nobody to succeed him. So that is my understanding. That's why it's closing. This is also going to be something that you um, understand that uh, I had a conversation five years ago, and this is really important, that you're now looking at a huge percentage of the mom and pop's stores in this country, music stores, they're owned by essentially um, borderline retirees, okay? I mean, there's no short way to say that. And here's what I can tell you. I don't I don't want to say this for 100% certainty, but I will tell you that if you're going to be a betting person, right? Thank you, Amanda, for su successorship. Um, if you're going to bet, if you're a betting person, I would put your money on this. If you go into a store and the person that owns that store is in retirement age, because a lot of them are past retirement age. They just keep working because they like to work, or maybe sometimes they can't retire, but most times they like to work, um, or they're borderline retirement age. If you don't see a son or daughter or a grandchild or somebody going, yeah, this is Pete. He's my grandson. He's the manager. If you don't see that, that store is going one of two ways. It's either going to be sold off, and when it's sold, there is a 50% uh, likeliness that it will not succeed and continue, or it will get essentially handed to somebody who works there, and I have seen that go even worse <laughs> for the most part. Um, no offense to the employees and stuff that do that, but a lot of times, you know, just because you have an opportunity doesn't mean you're ready for the opportunity. So there's a lot of that. Now, that being said about mom and pop stores, I say that because that's in mass volume. I am very aware that when I'm hanging out with my friends, and I'm going to say friends, that are people in this industry who own companies. And I mean this with all the love I can dish up because they're my friends. Um, I can think of 20 friends right now in this industry who I respect on a level I can't explain. I, they are the smartest people I've ever met. They are iconic in every way, and they're, they're awesome. They're also in their late 60s, 70s, and there is no successorship as far as I can see for their companies. So I don't know what that means. I almost don't have, I don't have, the, I don't have the guts to ask them half the time. Like, where does this go? You know, um, I have a YouTube channel, so it's different for me. <laughs> if I stop making YouTube, you know, my kids can't make this YouTube video and they wouldn't want to, but I mean, they wouldn't, you know, there's no handoff there. Um, uh, same thing, like black, the black stock pickups that I make are a very, very small endeavor. As you know, I'm winding the pickups myself and very small, but same thing. If I was to stop winding the pickups, who would do them for me? I have no successorship. So, um, but it's, it's going to happen in the next decade. You're going to see the industry changing hands off. Uh, it's why it's why um, Randall Smith sold um, Mesa Boogie to Gibson um, for that same reason. You know what I mean? He's he's at an age. It's why Mike Saldano sold Saldano to um, Boutique Amp Distribution. It's why it happens. You know, they get to the age where they're like, I, and I'm not guessing. Mike Saldano told me. He's like, yeah, you know, I don't want to fix amps all day and then sweep the shop and then worry about the bills. I don't, you know, I'm done. I'll, I'm going to do something else now. And so, um, there is that good news though. If you're into carbon fiber guitars, I recently acquired a carbon fiber guitar. Um, and, uh, and, uh, it is my favorite carbon fiber guitar I've ever gotten in my entire life ever, 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 ever. In fact, um, 
I'm doing a deep dive on it. And it's a funny thing. I talked to the owner and you guys have, you don't know it's Emerald guitars. <laughs> so, um, and what's different about Emerald guitars is, um, when I told you guys, I tell you guys all the time that I don't solicit companies that usually they solicit me. They say, Hey, would you like to be on the, you know, we'd like to be on the channel. Uh, Emerald guitars is definitely, I solicited them. Um, uh, my buddy Larry Mitchell got one and I just became infatuated with it. As you guys know, I'm huge into carbon fiber and I didn't know. And um, what happened with uh, Emerald Guitars, I thought I'd share this with you, is that um, when they when I talked to them, I told them, like, I don't I don't want you to, you know, give me a guitar. You don't need to pay me to do the video. Um, I, I'd like you to loan me the guitar. And I go, as long as I want to uh, borrow it. So um, that's the deal I made with them, uh, which they agreed to, which was very cool, which is loan me the guitar. If I ever don't want it for any reason, it'll go back, right? So if that means a month, it means a year, a couple years, a week, a day, it doesn't matter. But I can tell you now, not only am I making the video, I'm buying one. So I'm, I'm, I'm wor I've been working it up on their website. I just love their guitars. Um, in the video, you'll see, uh, uh, you know, I'll, I don't want to spoil the videos. Sometimes it's tough, but man, flawless. Um, the only negatives are. They could be negatives if you think they are, and they're negatives if they, they're not any negatives like uh, quality or construction or build or design. It's just, you know, there's shortcomings to carbon fiber versus wood, just like there's shortcomings of wood versus carbon fiber. So if some of those things bug you, I mentioned them in the video, like, hey, this is some of the things you might want to be aware of. And if they, they don't happen to bug me at all, which is, again, not defects, but just differences in the construction and stuff like that, you know. Um, so... So there you go. So there's a successor to that, so to speak, right? There's another company making them. And I personally think the uh, the Ireland-made uh, Emerald Guitars, I, I just love them far superior to the Rain Song stuff. And uh, what was the other one? Acoustic Image or something was with PV Owns now, right? And I don't think they're doing anything with it either, but whatever, superior to those as well. So... Um, uh, Steve Ross Resser says, doesn't Sweetwater open all those $3, he says $3,000 three to $3, $3, to $4,000 guitars when they get them? So they should see that they are bad as soon as they get them. Yes. And I, I, because again, I cannot accuse somebody of something because that doesn't, yeah, it's not right. Um, I'm giving you my educated guess. My educated guess, which could be, it's educated guess. It's just a guess. And I want to be educated. I mean, because I've spent nine days reach at Sweetwater researching how they do all this stuff based on that information. My life in the industry, owning a store, repairing guitars, you know, uh, you know, you name it. Uh, working on the back end and marketing for a lot of these companies. You you name what I've done. Those collective that collective uh, information tells me that Sweetwater got these guitars, found those issues, and then just marked them as used demo instruments because what what are you going to do with them? Send them back and have them refinished? Then they're B-stocks, you know? Um, so they're just discounting them, you know, and they're going. My guess, again, educated guess, Sweetwater opened the box, looked at the guitar, assessed it overall, and decided that if it's mostly cosmetic damage, then somebody will probably be interested in this guitar at a discount because that's absolutely true. People are all the time. And they probably reached out to BC Rich and said, these guitars were damages, damaged or defective or whatever. We would like a discount, you know, for this merchandise. Um, it is something I did in my shop many times. Sometimes a guitar would come in. It would be have defects or damage of some sort. And sometimes I would call the manufacturer and say, this is unacceptable and it has to go back. That was very rare though. Most of the time, you would call the manufacturer and say, here, I have pictures. This is what it happened. This is what it looks like. And I would like a discount and I will offer the discount to the customer. Um, and there's a reason why they do that. One, because where is the goods are going to go any other ways? Like I said, the, the cost of resources to put in a box, ship it across the country again, you know what I mean? Have it go through some kind of service and repair. And then, like I said, if, if you're being honest, which they should be, and if you're having integrity, which they should, you're going to mark it, even if you refurbished it, you're going to mark it that you refurbished it, um, you know, and discount it somehow. So either way, you're discounting it. You see what I'm saying? Um, and uh, so sometimes it's just easier to say, well, instead of going through all that, why don't we just discount it up front and just say that it's been demoed or used, right? Because how, how the damage is irrelevant to the end user. I don't, 
know if you guys are like that. I've never really ever asked anybody who dented a guitar. <laughs> if I bought a guitar with a dent, I never said, hmm, did this get dented out of the factory or did it get dented by a customer? Because if it's by the factory, I don't want to buy it. But if the dent is from a customer, I will take this guitar right now, <laughs> right? Um, it's just damage and you can get the discount. And the other incentive, so you know, to the retailer to do this is usually the discount given to the retailer is larger than the discount given to the customer, even if that discount is the same. And so obviously do the math on that. If a customer, do I need a calculator for this? <laughs> I need a calculator because I'm talking and I just don't want to be wrong. So if a guitar is $6,000 and they say um, uh, $6,000, let's say that guitar cost uh, Sweetwater $12. No, I'm just kidding. It would cost Sweetwater. I don't know why I'm having trouble with this. Um, uh Let's say 65% of that, $3,900. So 35% margin, let's say that. So $3,900. Okay, so the customer pays 6,000, they're paying 39. That's about right. Now, again, that doesn't factor in that they gotta pay employees and the air conditioning and all this stuff. That's just the hard cost of it. They gave somebody 3,900 and they expect you to give them 6,000 for it. Um, they tell Beast Rich, this guitar is defective. They want a discount. Beast Rich takes 10% off. So that makes sense, right? So you're going to take $390 off that. So now the guitar costs we water, in theory, or the, the retailer, I should just say retailer, $3,500, okay? Now, if they give you 10% off the guitar, $6,000, right? So um, it's, well, it's $600 off, which makes it 54 The numbers don't really probably, that's why I need a calculator, probably don't line up to you, but the discount to the, you see what I'm saying? They're not really eating anything that much. It kind of works out. I, I probably should stick with the calculator on this, but I've done it so many times in the past. I just know it always kind of works out. So um, Brian says, what is the build cost of a $6,500 guitar? Um, well, it depends. So uh, here is... Um, here is from the mouth of babes, so to speak. Uh, you know, Grover Jackson does a lot of OEM work as he pu pub pub uh, publicly publishes constantly on his on his Instagram stuff. You know, hey, if you need anybody to build guitars, uh, you know, build you know, I'll build guitars. Um, there is an attitude, and the attitude is that sometimes the the brand, that's how you look at this. There's the brand. Badlands is a brand. It's not a builder. It's a brand. And then there's a builder. And the builder, let's say the builder's like, I can build this guitar for $1,500, okay? And I'll sell it to you for $2,000. Maybe that's their, that's their, no, no, believe it or not, they don't always double their money. Some companies can double their money. Some companies don't. Some companies triple it. Some companies only make 10%. You know, you guys all work in industries. Everybody knows percentages are all over the place and people do what they can't, what do they do what they can do. So let's say this builder says, I can build a guitar for $1,500. I'll sell it to you for 2000 now you have the brand. Now the brand, and a lot of them do, will just look at it as if I pay $2,000, somebody's giving me four. I double my money, <laughs> right? Um, and then if you then sell the guitar to a retailer for $4,000, the retailer's like, I would like, the retailer's gonna want at least 30% margin. They're going to try to get 40% margin. Very rarely is a retailer going to double their money. Um, but 30% margin, same kind of math continues, right? So it is possible. I'm not saying it happened, but it's possible. If you're talking about $6,000 guitar, it could have started with a guitar that cost $1,500 to build. That's That sounds bad, but I can show you math where a guitar that cost you $700 could start as low as, as being built for $190 or $116. I'm not exaggerating. One of the complaints I had about Glary guitars when people were complaining, they're like, Glary guitars, oh. I'm like, <laughs> they're like, they're making these guitars for $70. Let me tell you why. I love how everybody's like, let me tell you why. It's all kinds, it's, it's you know, the slave labor and stuff. Look, I, I, I'm totally aware of all that stuff. Like I said, I tell you guys all the time, if anyone has proof of any of that footage, give me that stuff. I will share it on the internet. My problem is, is no matter what you do, you can't find that information to find out who's actually treating their employees the worst. I've they're Just because the company makes guitars overseas does not mean they treat their employees horribly. It just doesn't. There's all kinds of, there's all kinds of factors, right? Um, there is likelihood that it is, but it's not, not guaranteed. 
But what's interesting is um, when companies sell guitars, they're cheap like that. There are other reasons. First, they might be trying to grab market share, which I've talked about. And the market share could be as simple as they're like, uh, you know, we want we want to sell 10,000 guitars because that'll get our brand out there. And and we're going to move them. And this is how we're going to move them. We're going to put it really, really low. Um, the... Um, the other reason their pricing can be low is because they're so used to selling to another manufacturer. But what I told you guys all the time, advertising cost is a huge part of this. Um, back to the Badlands business model that's important is the Badlands middle business model had zero advertising costs. Zero. Zero. Which is where my involvement, one of the things I was involved with is part of that. Uh, I didn't charge Badlands anything to advertise for them. I didn't say anything. So, so you know, uh, that's last year when I did Badlands. I worked with four companies that year, and the sa- in the same capacity, not in the same capacity of like a you know kind of ownership role. Because like I said, the Badlands guys were friends, and they they just didn't have the money. Um, I mean, you know, I would never work for a, a third party. I would never work for a company if a company just reached out to me and said, "Hey, we want you to help us sell 100 guitars, and we won't pay you a dime." <laughs> I'd be like, "Sweet." Like no, what? <laughs> That's just dumb, <laughs> right? What? What? What do I want to do that for? Um, as you guys know, I bought every single guitar of every Badlands guitar I ever bought. I bought them all. Uh, I, like I said, no, I was given nothing, and um, and uh, and that is how people's guitars got cheaper. Because when uh, you know, I don't want to pick on a brand, but when a nice brand sends me a beautiful guitar in exchange for a video, because like everyone says free guitars, but I always tell you it's a trade. They're trading for the access to you guys. You're the commodity, right? They want, they go, hey, people are watching Phil. If we give Phil a guitar, people will see the guitar, they buy the guitar. And if Phil will hold the guitar, we'll let him have the guitar. That's the trade. Or sometimes we'll pay them, pay me. Depends on, you know, like I said, depends on what it is and what the deal is. Um, And like I said, sometimes I forward the money charity. There's all kinds of ways I negotiate it. But the importance of this is uh, that costs you guys because that guitar they sent me has to be div- – that cost of that guitar is divided out by all the guitars you buy. I think this is getting too rudimentary. I feel like I'm just teaching too much of a basics class. Let's get back to uh, – um, Brian said, I saw guitologists rip into <laughs> – guitologists rip into Gibson amps. He called them unmitigated. Uh, crap. Oh, okay, I said crap. Um, yeah, you know, I mean, you know, there's an opinion. I, I don't have an opinion. So I, you know, he could be absolutely right. Isn't that funny? I don't know. Uh, they don't interest me. The only thing, like I said, was I was shocked that they weren't more. I'm not saying that they're priced great and you should run out and grab one. I'm not endorsing it that way. I'm saying I was shocked that the greed was not higher, higher, or that there wasn't more greed. They're priced, I thought they were priced at, if you look at the market, they're priced in what amps are selling for and that, with those specs and those standards. And, and um, I was shocked. I was expecting a Gibson amp to be $8,000 and we're only making six until six people buy them and then we're making 800. So, um, so okay. Uh, let's see. Uh, okay. Um, hold on a second. Sorry, I'm just scanning for a second. Looking for some of the comments to see. Um... Fred, wants, Fred Flintstone wants to know, are the PRS Silver Skies SEs, Silver Sky SEs, very clear to, uh, to say SE, uh, devalued because so many of them are floating around and discontinued? No, discontinued will usually raise the price, the value of them. If they're devalued right now, it's because they just massive discounted the, the new ones. Um, SEs are going to take a little bit to... Um, uh, you know, take... They got to take the hit, man. You know, it's just... Uh, think of it like the car market. You know, the dealerships have tons of cars. They start blowing them out. You Everywhere you go, it's sale, deal, 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 you know. And, you know, no one's expecting to pay sticker walking on the lot because they're like, we got 50 of these and we'll definitely sell you one for cheap. And uh, and then 
what happens is that that hurts everything. It hurts the used market. It hurts everything. You right? It's it's people getting the mindset of like, well, I'm not going to buy it unless it's a deal. I, I'm exactly in that mindset right now. I'm not buying anything unless I so want it so bad that it's just killing me, which is not going to be the true the the case. Um, I don't buy anything unless somebody's not going to give me some kind of some kind of you know compensation deal mar you know sale and i've been doing the same as i told you guys this is not a good time to sell guitars i've sold a couple recently uh for me it's just space issues you know um i just you know i just only have so much room you know all this stuff just starts stacking up and i feel i actually get like i feel choked claustrophobic from it <laughs> so um and i'm like okay some of this stuff's got to go and uh, i let it all go for less than what i wanted uh but I don't regret it because like I said, for what I was after, which was space, I got the space. So this is from Scott. It says, hey, Phil, what's your thoughts on guitars with amp effects simulation built in, such as the Moore, Moore uh, up and coming tech or fad? Um, it is constantly done and it's redone and it's redone and it's redone. And, uh, you know, I I'm not a fan. And... I didn't realize, and that's okay, I didn't realize that when I was doing content over the years that sometimes when I would, my my curiosity would get the better of me. Somebody would go, hey, you ever, you, you ever wanted a guitar that also, you know, <laughs> had Red Bull? You know, like, you can drink Red Bull from it or whatever, right? I'm just being sarcastic. but And I'd be like, yeah, I was curious. And I would do this guitar and then people would reach out and go, yeah, this is really cool. And I'm like, yeah, it was cool, but... You know, it's kind of, like I said, it's kind of a fad thing more so than what you're talking about. I, I try now to be more accurate in that type of description of the video that I think I'm looking at this for the curiosity of it. This isn't something I'm endorsing so much as I think this is amazing. I'm just more interested in it. And if you like, it's great, but don't think that I somehow, you know, I don't want you to feel like, oh yeah, when you said it was the best thing I ever had, I'm like, I, oh, I don't remember saying that. Um, I'm not into guitars with effects. I'm not, so, you know, I have trouble. I, I like... I like a guitar with a um, transducer saddle pickup, like the Parker, like the you know, Music Man, and like the uh, PRS hollow bodies. That being said, that is the most I want a guitar to add as features, and I don't even love that um, because I, I, it affects the sound. I don't think guitars that have transducer pickups and magnetic pickups always sound this, uh, the best because... Um, if you guys know anything about how they're wired together, most of them have to be wired in a way that the magnetics run through some kind of preamp so that the volumes can be equalized and balanced out. And I always feel like there's a uh, different sound to the pickups, even if they're the same pickups. Perfect example is PRS. I have a PRS hollow body too. It's got 5708s. If I was to AB it against my other PRS S 5708s, I always feel like the 5708s in my non hollow body sound more, I want to say organic, I guess is a word, or sounds, you know, more true to the, what the pickup sounds where the 5708s in the active guitar almost have like a EMG kind of vibe to them. Like they're, like I said, they've been run through some kind of active preamp because they have been. Um, so I'm not big on that. Um, but if you are into that stuff, don't let me dissuade you. You see what I'm saying? I'm not trying not to hurt your feelings. I'm just saying, don't let some dumbass on the internet uh, change your mind about something because they said, oh, it's not for me. But it is not for me. Yeah, Derek says, uh, do you remember around 10 to 12 years ago? God, was it that long? It probably was. Ibanez brought out an RG with a small tablet-like device. They did. Um, yeah, uh, routed into the top. It had an effects in it. Yep, yeah, um, I probably can find it. This is one, uh, and then I thought, I agree with you, I think there was one that was more of a, just a pad or the pad was on the back. But this was definitely, so you guys don't know, you take your finger, you could hit a note, and then take your finger and you slide around like it's a touch screen, and you can make all these weird sounds. This was uh, definitely inspired by like Muse and stuff, you know, the band Muse and and doing stuff like that. And, um, and, and um, although, you know, you could put that in the gimmick realm of things, it was definitely, you know, the different than putting just distortion and delay in a guitar, this had a purpose. Um, it was a very unique purpose, is <laughs> right? It's a, it's a, it's a niche of a niche of a niche, yeah, right? Um, I mean, think about this. There's probably less of those guitars ever made than double neck, you know, a, a like uh, type guitar with a double neck. Um, there's less people probably wanted that than a double neck guitar, which is not a lot of people. Um, but it was definitely for someone to, um, you know, do something specific. Uh, Michael says, is there a good resource for figuring out all the Parker models? I see them used a lot and I have an, I, no idea about the models and errors. There, it is a little, is a little overwhelming. 
okay? Um, the the Parker guitars as a whole, there's going to be tons of variations. You could go forever, and I'm sure you can find some resources. I'm sure there's catalogs out there and stuff. To, to, to make it easy for you, just think of it this way. You have the, think of it like a Paul Reed Smith guitar. But essentially, Paul Reed Smith is really better at naming things like core, you know, private stock, core, you know, S2, SE, you know, right? And SE standard. And then you go, okay, that's your line, you know, so SE standard is going to be very, uh, the least expensive guitars and the private stocks will be the most expensive. And then maybe there's artist packages and you see where it gets a little, there's inserts in those, but just stick to the, to the main things. With Parker, you're going to have a, basically your core guitars. Your core guitars are going to be like your night flies, your mojos, the things like that. They're the very expensive guitars. They tend to have, um, so they tend to, to look like their neck through, but they're set neck, you know, white one piece guitars. Then you'll have night flies, USA made night flies. Okay. Um, and those will sometimes look like strats, sometimes look like tellies. They're made in the USA. And there's also, there's, the, there's even other, uh, guitars like, um, like there's a dragons, like that, not dragonflies. Cause that was, you know, like I said, that was kibosh pretty fast, that name, but like the, that body shape of the dragonfly I'm pointing here, but with a bolt on neck made in the USA. Keep in mind, everything I'm saying is made in the USA. We're not, we're not talking about anything, but made in the USA yet. So bolt on. So think about like, same thing with Paul Reed Smith. You have your set neck series of Parkers. That's going to be your expensive stuff. There is a custom shop level of Parkers. Okay. That stuff is crazy and you'll know it by looking at it. You don't need anyone to explain it to you. It'll have a crazy price tag and it'll look really crazy because it's got beautiful wood or graphics or something, but essentially all the USA guitars. Then you have bolt on USA guitars, which are essentially the affordable guitars. That was before they knew to go overseas and make clones of their USA guitars. That's what Parker was doing. He's like, hey, we can't sell everybody a $3,000 guitar in 1999. How do we get the price down? And we go, oh, well, we'll build a bolt-on version and the bolt-on version will be $12.99, right? Whatever the prices were back then. Then later, there is import series. And the import series um, are, again, different body shapes and stuff, but they're usually made in Indonesia. Some are made in Korea. Um, they have a Les Paul shaped one and they have, you know, a Parker shaped one, a Tele one, say all the same things, but they're the import series. I would say in the Parker lineup, that would be the three tiers I would look at. Models, oh, you can make yourself nuts because there's just so many variations. But um, the the tier, I would say USA Core, USA Bolt-On, and then import uh, set neck and then import Bolt-On. That's how I would, I would think of the pricing and logic of that. And as far as I know, they never did import set necks that look like the Parker flies. They always did in next, uh, uh, overseas uh, uh, set necks that look like like a Les Paul variation. Michael says, I have a, a friend of mine uh, owned a factory in China. It was eye-opening to find out what things cost. Well, again, this is the interesting part about cost, right? Um, you know, if somebody said, hey, this uh, this pencil costs a dollar to make and then somebody's paying ten dollars for it by the end of the store, they go, that's ridiculous. Right. And um, they could be right. The problem is, is that in between that pencil being made uh, and again, I'm not like pencil being made, then shipped. I'm not even talking about that. It is not uncommon for marketing costs to be the biggest, the single biggest cost of a product. It is very hard to get your product in front of people. Um, it is super crazy expensive. It's just nuts. And um, because, you know, it's hard to get people's attention. Think about this. Look at how hard this is to keep people's attention. So, um, you know, let them know, you know, how many times, how many times have you guys, you know, you like a brand and how many times then all of a sudden you go, oh, I didn't even know they came out with that, <laughs> you know, because they, you didn't know. And they, they lost the opportunity to sell it to you because you didn't know. So uh, marketing can be a huge, huge part of costs. And and that's why they want to keep the other costs under control. And they can do that because especially, um, I've said this before, we're recapping a conversation I had with, or told you guys about a couple years ago. No, not a couple years, months ago, maybe six, seven months ago, where I said, when I was talking to somebody, Paul Reese, Paul Reese Smith said they would never, Somebody at Paul, Paul Reed Smith, someone who I, I know very well, said Paul Reed Smith will never sell direct to consumer. And I said, never say never. And they said, oh, no. They go, I would be shocked if it ever happened here. And I said, here's the problem. You're looking at it as, you know, changing a, 
a philosophy of the company like, oh, we're going to sell direct to customers even though we don't like the way that arrangement works with our dealers and we don't like this. And you're talking about that. But what you're missing is is that when, uh, when I'm not saying uh, you know it, it's happening, but when Gibson goes direct and when Fender goes direct and when uh, Heritage goes direct and when, you know, Kiesel's already direct and when, you know, uh, uh, you know, insert brand, I just keep going. I got to look at brands. Ibanez goes direct. When everybody's going direct at some point, what's happening is when they're not cutting in a retailer for 20, 30, 40% margins. And then what they do with the money, cause they're not lowering their prices. Very few people have, very few companies have done that. I can only name about a half a dozen of them. And, um, and every time and that, to be fair, and I mean this with all the kindness I can muster, Every company I know of that went direct and lowered their prices did it out of the sheer desperation of that that they were just trying to move product. And they didn't do it. They're not doing anybody a favor. They'll spin it that way. That's a good way to spin it. I would have told them to do that if they asked me, right? They said, "Hey Phil, we're thinking about going direct and lower our prices. What should we say?" I'd be like, "Tell them you're doing it because you love everybody." <laughs> right because that's good marketing to say that right and you go oh they love me and they lowered their prices and they're going direct but the reality is they they lowered their price because they they're not selling you know the dealers weren't selling and now they're going to go direct and they they they're probably still not selling so they lower their price um but back to going direct when they go direct they save the margin that they give the dealer the importance is is your first thought is well they just pocket that and you're thinking they pocket it and then they buy a ferrari or whatever you think that people buy when they make this money. But what you don't understand is if you really think like a business, a business, you don't think, oh, I'm going to take that extra 20, 30% margin, put it in my pocket. You think I'm going to take that 20, 30, 30% margin. I'm going to use that to advertise people more, let more people buy, buy, sell even more guitars. And then I'm going to buy a Ferrari, right? Like I'm going to literally move more product. And so, and then when that happens, here's the problem. What does Paul Reed Smith do? when Gibson and Fender aren't making more margin than them, that's already tough. That would be already tough, but they're selling so hard against them that, um, like I said, if every video could you, and I've said this before, Gibson and Fender, no one else, no one else, not in the guitar world, you know, other industries, keyboards, all that stuff. There's all kinds of factors, pedals. Sure. Guitar world. If Gibson and Fender wanted it, they could make it to where, unfortunately they can make it to where all of us are miserable. And every video is about their product. When I say every, don't be so, don't be so in crazy about it, right? Um, I mean, if you know a channel puts out fifty videos a year, fifty-two videos a year, one a week, Gibson and Fender could make sure they're definitely fifty percent of those videos. It'll feel like every time you turn around, and you won't even know what's happening. By the way, you think you guys, you know, we all think of us as so smart, you know, because every video will be like I'm reviewing a Gibson, but it will be like I'm reviewing this Fender amp with this Gibson. I'm reviewing this Fishman amp with this Gibson. I'm reviewing this. I'm reviewing this new microphone with this Gibson. Right? Like it doesn't just come in the one form factor. Um, so you know, uh, it comes in multiple form factors. It's a very. Uh, it can you know so those guys have that ability. They can make that happen. I've told you guys before, I, I was uh, never could be more right ever, uh, whether it was accident or I predicted it like I thought. I told you guys when Sweet, if Sweetwater ever got the inclination to put their branding everywhere, it would just be impossible because they have so, their pockets are so deep, you know? Um, and the internet is so cheap to buy. You know, YouTube videos can be bought for dollars. I don't, when I mean dollars, I'm not being sarcastic. Dollars, tens of dollars, maybe sometimes hundreds of dollars, but dollars, dollars, <laughs> you know, um, I have friends that have small channels and they tell me like, oh, this company sent me two packs of strings. So I made a video. Literally that's making a video for $12 in strings, say about her dollars. So you can imagine if that string company is like, we'll send you two packs of strings. They're like, sorry, I got 72 Gibson videos to do. <laughs> I got to do these videos because they, they're making us do videos. So it could, it could happen. Um, and then PRS would have to make adjustments. Okay. Um, <laughs> Brian says, Gibson loves me. This I know. Cause Phil tells me so. Yeah. Um, uh, okay. That's funny. Um, okay. Hold on a second. Um, the, um, 
You guys, some of you guys are talking about overseas factories. So you know, I've uh, I asked, I I did reach out to uh, to to June, uh, who owns uh, Cortec. Um, he was very, you know, like I said, he's very he's a fan of the channel. So uh, the podcast, he's a fan of the podcast. He's not watching guitar reviews. <laughs> he listens to the podcast. Um, and um, he's uh. You know, that's how I met Larry DiMarzio. He was watching the podcast and he reached out to me one day. A lot of a lot of people in the industry, they'll, they'll just see this conversation and they find it interesting that us nerds are talking about all this stuff. This is the stuff that they find interesting and they didn't think anybody else did. Um, and uh, he reached out and and um, and uh, he asked me if he could use a clip of something I said in a podcast uh, for their anniversary video they did. So if you go and look it up, You'll see the Cortec 50th anniversary vision. There's a clip of me saying some stuff and what I said. And I said, of course, and stuff. And so um, very cool. And of course, you can imagine um, when we're talking, I said, hey, anytime I would love to fly out and do some videos of the Cortec factory. Uh, some, you know, kind of like what I did with Kiesel, like one shot, one through, no edit, something like that. Or maybe if we have to do edits, whatever, just something fun and exciting. So hopefully we'll get that done. And then you can see that experience too. Um, this one came from Todd. Todd says, hey, Phil, I know it's important to let your guitar acclimate to environment after delivery, but would that hold true with an amp as well, specifically a tube amp? Thanks. Um, he says, never miss a show. Thanks, Todd. I appreciate that. Um, you know, the amp, I can't imagine. Hey, look, let's let's take out the anomalies, okay? I don't know if you live in Antarctica. <laughs> I don't know. We live somewhere where it's it's 50 minus zero or whatever. I mean, where I live in Arizona, we don't even get close to zero. I don't even know what that temperature is. I don't even barely know what freezing is. Um, but if you if you you know if you live in a place where maybe it's temperatures are so low, could that affect something? If you took because they're glass tubes, maybe if you took something that was frozen, you know, a, a place where you could take a hot hot water and throw it in the air and make that smoke looking thing that I see on the internet. Uh, if you could do that, maybe I'd wait for the amp to warm up before, you know, in the room before I'd open it to see if it was dramatic, um, you know, change. I can't imagine even that because I'm sure the amp's not really going to be much different in the box than it would outside the box. Other than that extreme scenario, um, no, there would be no reason for that. Um, the Usually the only reason people talk about, you know, the only only conversation I've ever heard or had or seen about tube amplifiers and caution is um, some guitar players will turn off their tube amps and let them sit for a little while before they transport them. So like if they're at the gig, they turn them off, they let them sit on the side of the stage or whatever, let it cool down before taking it and going because the glass is hot and all that stuff. Uh, but again, I think that has to do with if it's really cold outside, right? Just like um, warming up the tube amp, you know, you might want to warm up the tubes if they're really cold, but um, like I don't use my standby. I flip both switches most time. I just reach over and flip both. I don't hit standby, then power. I just do both at the same time. Um, you know, it's uh, the average, um, the temp in this room right now is 73 degrees in this room. So, um, and I would say this room maintains 73 to, on the high it's 76 and on the low it's probably 69 degrees. That's the variance of this room throughout the entire year. So I'm not worrying about anything like that. Um, and like I said, unless you have some kind of extremes, I wouldn't even think about it. But for the most part, I wouldn't even still worry about it. But barring extremes, I wouldn't worry about it. I feel like I'm too far away from this microphone. I apologize. Um, let's see. Uh, uh, Dave, Dave's question, really tube question. It's funny. Interesting. Dave says, as many of us mitigate a bit of other means of application, okay, is there anything, let's just get to the core of it. Is there anything we should be doing to our tube amps to elongate their life as they sit more often and not used. Oh, um, yes, there is something you, I'm not kidding. There are things you can do to make your tube amp last longer. And he's specifically saying, if you don't use it, that's what I'm getting from that question. So if you use it, there's something you do, not use it. You should put a cover over it. Um, you know, if you have some old towels, if you have some something like that, throw it over the top of the head. Um, dust and electronics are, are no moss. They don't like each other. So. Um, if you first, not only can the dust be bad over time, cause it's just going to, you know, it's just getting in there, but also, you know, makes pots dirty and, and makes you have to clean them and stuff. But essentially, yes, dirt is the enemy 
of tube amplifiers sitting even if they're not being used. So this is why so many companies give you covers because not only for transporting them, but for also when they sit, um, do, do that, right? The other thing uh, when you are using amp, things you can do to help them last longer. Well, you gotta understand, attenuators, putting an amp through an attenuator is no different than cranking an amp. You're going to be bur burning through tubes faster. Um, and that will have an effect. So you have to think about that if that's something you, you know, wanna do or not do. So what I'm basically saying is if you don't need to attenuate the amp or, you know, for sound, cause some people just do it cause they just do it. Um, I don't particularly do anything. I've never really had any problems. I always, I'm always scared to say that out loud in these shows because I'm always like, then my amp's going to break this week, one of them. But I I rarely have any problems with amps. Um, I tend to own amps in a realistic fashion, which means there's an amp I buy, and if it's boutique, it's because there's just something I, I, you know, I'm fascinated about it or I like it and I have it, and maybe that's not what I drag to somebody's house when I go jam. I have amps that I just know I can beat the snot out of and I take them with me. So, and I've never had any problems. Okay, so uh, thank you guys as always. As you guys know, this show is sponsored by... Today's episode is sponsored by Moon Pie Guitars because the guitar you have sucks. That's not true. I don't know where that came from. This show is sponsored by patrons and channel members and I appreciate you guys sponsoring the podcast uh, and, uh, and thank you so much for doing that. All right, as always, guys, I want to thank you so much for your time and till next week, know your gear. The Know Your Gear podcast is not responsible for any spontaneous guitar purchases you make during or after the show.